Welcome to session two of the PayPal story. So we'll start with a brief recap of session one, where I think the central message was that failure can lead to success. So I tried to uh, do the startup, which was called ZipPay. I kind of started off with this assumption that I must to make this idea that I had uh, successful. Uh, I must do my own startup. I must be the CEO. Uh, uh, I did not really consider uh, that I could join another uh, startup uh, and that that might actually be a better option, uh, you know, given uh, my kind of profile. Uh, so um, I tried. I was reasonably successful in trying to raise, raise an angel round. But ultimately, I failed. Uh, but that failure actually led to success. So I think that is a key learning. And to get more details, you can look at uh, session one. Now, the other thing that was there was that uh, in the early days after I had joined uh, PayPal, one of the things that really motivated me to put in uh, 100 hour work weeks was the BHAG or the big, hairy, audacious goal that Elon and us set for the company. And it motivated a lot of others. We felt we were changing the world. So the BHAG was that one day PayPal would move uh, 1 trillion US dollars a year. And we came up with this number of 1 trillion because I had looked at uh, a BCG study on global payments. And uh, that said that there was 1600 trillion uh, dollars that move um, um, and uh, both domestic and global and uh, across the entire world. So we said, well, if we are going to change the world, then we should be able to move 1 trillion if there is 1,600 trillion, because by the time we change the world, the 1,600 trillion will also grow. So that was one factor. And the other factor was that here was this young person who had just recently got married, uh, that's Elon, and uh, he was spending like 16 hours a day, uh, you know, um, working in the office when he had sold a company for $300 million in cash. And he could say that, well, you know, I am set for life and I can retire. But he was putting in this huge amount of effort and motivating everyone and setting the example. So that was very key. Now, in terms of uh, 100 hour weeks, now, this may seem that, you know, I'm exaggerating because a week has only 168 hours and you've got to sleep and you've got to brush your teeth, and, you know, eat food, et cetera, et cetera. So how can you work for 100 hours? Um, and you have to take care of a few personal items as well. So, uh, but what I'm saying is that for the first three or four months, um, or maybe till maybe January, till the team size grew to about 60, 70 people. The initial founding team, um, we did put in about 100 hour work weeks. And we were working on the product. So a typical meeting where the head of technology, Elon and me uh, would meet. Uh, would start at around eight o'clock after we had knocked off for the day, uh, gone back home, showered, had dinner, an early dinner and come back. And that, that would continue till two or three in the morning. And then we were back at work at 9 a.m. the next day. Or maybe even earlier than 9 a.m. So this was the kind of uh, thing that we did on the product side. And uh, then we uh, looked at uh, trying to do deals. Now, deals was something that I did not understand uh, because um, 
you know, it was all about trying to get eyeballs and you just try and do deals at saying, okay, you refer my website, I'll, I'll refer your website. And uh, we would just, so one of the metrics was how many deals had you done? So we did deals with companies like eCircles and many other companies that I now forget. Uh, so we were running around doing deals, we were developing the product, we were setting up backend systems, we were trying to recruit people. And every day, we would have a 5 p.m. meeting, uh, which was a, like a standing meeting if you were there physically or you would dial in if you were not. And uh, it was very quick where we would each say, what did we do today? What do we plan to do? Elon would ask us questions. And there were no detailed discussions because that was all done offline. Uh, but this was... Uh, sort of a religion, the 5 p.m. meeting, uh, which was done every single day. So that was what the environment was uh, in X.com when I joined. And with a team of around 10 engineers and maybe like four or five other people, uh, we actually got the first version of PayPal up and running uh, within 90 days or less. I mean, like we launched on um, December 7th. So it was actually, um, you know, maybe 70 days or something like that, that we got uh, the first version of PayPal running. Uh, so that is what uh, like Silicon Valley, hard charging, fast paced startups are like. So December 7th, 1999, and I remember that because, you know, December 7th is Pearl Harbor Day. And we had this dollar ten deal, uh, which was, it was quite critical that we launched by December 7th because we were just a bit before Christmas. And a lot of uh, students, which was why the .edu domain was very important for us, uh, where we would give $10 if you sign up and $10 if uh, the uh, person you referred signed up so you could very easily make $1,000. And this resulted by January 31 of uh, 2000, are uh, getting 250,000 accounts. Now you've got to remember that at that time, uh, across all financial products, across all financial internet products, um, across all domains, the total number of accounts across all companies was 250,000. So we got 250,000 accounts for x.com within one month and double the number of people accounts in the sort of fintech space as it's now called. The other amazing thing and really amazing story, and this kind of explains why Silicon Valley and the US kind of lead and why so many very large companies come out of Silicon Valley. Now, maybe companies in China are catching up, but still, what makes Silicon Valley and the US so special? So Silicon Valley, it's more like it's an ecosystem. Uh, you heard about how I, when I raised angel funding, uh, you know, I got connected with the venture law group and how they made it very easy for me as an entrepreneur to get started. Um, you saw how Elon recruited me um, and uh, how we were all motivated to change the world and to put in 100 hour work weeks. But there was a very important thing in the dot-com boom, and that was that the White House, that's the administration, uh, all political parties, so it was like a bipartisan effort, uh, regulatory bodies like the Federal Reserve and the judiciary uh, were all on the same page that the internet was strategically important for America and they would do all that they could do to help internet companies. Now, as part of that effort, the Federal Reserve had a task force of young people who were scouting around for uh, interesting companies. 
Now, at that point in time, you've got to realize that X.com was an unknown company. There were thousands of companies like X.com. Elon Musk was also an unknown entity. We were not extensively covered in the media. We just had launched and we had done this dollar 10 thing. So we were on the radar of a lot of young people. So someone from this uh, Federal Reserve uh, team spotted us and told the vice chairman of the Fed that this looks like an interesting company. Now, the vice chairman of the Fed was an African-American called Roger Ferguson, and he decided uh, that he would check this out. He didn't ask a secretary or whatever. He himself went, opened an account, moved money, and then told his office to arrange a meeting between Elon and him as he was going to be traveling to San Francisco. So Elon got a call, and he took me along for this meeting because I was the payment expert in X.com. And the meeting lasted all of 10 minutes, but Roger basically said that, what are you guys trying to do? Don't tell me about what you uh, have done so far because I've used your product. So when we told them that we think we can change the world for the better and that payments, we can improve that big time. So he said, wonderful. We've been trying to get the banks and the credit card companies and all to do what you're trying to do for the last 20 years but they say it's not possible. You're gonna face a lot of hurdles. And this interview was uh, totally off the record or this meeting is off the record. Um, but uh, remember you have a friend in Washington. Now what this friend in Washington did was that companies like PayPal were allowed to operate without a license for around two years. Later on, just before it IPO, PayPal got a license uh, in 48 states as a money transmitter. Now this process was very time consuming and very costly. So had PayPal got, had to get these money transmitter type license, when it got started, it would have died and many other companies would have died. So the role of regulators, judiciary, government, in actually supporting innovation cannot be minimized. So the US often, not always, but often creates a very enabling ecosystem for entrepreneurship to flourish, which other countries do not do. So that is very key as to why the US succeeds in innovation. There is also another thing that companies in the US also support startups and so do consumers. So I think there is a fair amount of research now that one of the reasons why uh, startups, the big startups succeed in the US is because of the enabling ecosystem provided by regulators, government, judiciary, and by the larger companies, which are often uh, give deals to innovative startups to get started and then look to acquire them. And also consumers, because the consumers in the US are what are called venturesome consumers. So they're willing to try new things uh, and, um, you know, say open an account with an unknown name like x.com. Uh, so those are all some of the things which uh, are very interesting to learn about as to how uh, any country which wants to enable innovation can think about how they can create an enabling ecosystem for startups. So more in the next session. Thank you for listening to me.